Welcome everybody to today's video aimed at healthcare students who are writing a literature review for their dissertation. I've had so many students ask for this session. Um, I've marked lots of nursing dissertations over the years and recently conducted a literature review myself for my PhD, so I feel your pain. Um, and I'll be giving you lots of simple practical tips, example tables, signpost some good references and websites to help you, um, focusing on research questions, tips to help you search the literature, appraise your papers, critical analyze and theming your results. I can't cover everything in a short video. There's lots of books out there, but there will be some simple key tips during those key stages really of your dissertation. So I hope you find this helpful. If you do, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and let me know how you're getting on with your dissertations in the YouTube comments. So before I give you lots of tips, I'm going to start with your um, well-being, your physical and mental health. When you're conducting and writing a literature review, you often go through a range of emotions and it's important to know that that's normal. It's a challenging piece of work and I know I did when I was doing my dissertations. Um, you might ch question whether you've got the academic ability, uh, which you do because you wouldn't have got to this stage in your degree. You are balancing placements, coursework and your thesis. And at times you're going to feel incredibly frustrated. Will I ever get there? And then at the end, you feel elated that you've you know, managed to pass this amazing um, de this degree and, and this big piece of work. It's important to talk to your dissertation supervisors if you're feeling overwhelmed, to know that there's somebody there to talk to and to extend those deadlines um, when you're at hand in if you need to. Um, and just prioritise and be kind to yourself prioritise your well-being. So what is a literature review, especially if you're just starting out in your journey? You start with an area of interest. You should formulate a research question from that area of interest. You'll be critically appraising and analysing literature using systematic methods to answer that research question. And new insights should be gained once you've completed your literature review. Always check out your university assessment guidelines. Um, from the start so you know what the expectation is, as different universities have di slightly different guidelines. Um, usually they cover some key chapters such as an introduction chapter, method section, findings, themes, discussion and then conclusion. And if you look at books on how to write a literature review, you'll see that they often will cover those key areas as well. I really like Helen Aviard's quote that states, without the process of bringing together individual pieces of information to complete the jigsaw, an individual research study stands alone and its real impact and relevance can't be judged. And I think this really sums up what a literature review is about. It's about bringing together, critically appraising individual studies, but then there's a, um, the process of bringing them together to gain new insights and to make an impact and to influence future practice research or education. So some key tips before you start your literature review. Try and attend any university support sessions that are offered. Gain advice from your supervisor and book supervisory sessions early in advance. So once you know who your dissertation supervisor is, you need to have that initial meeting so your expectations and their expectations are discussed. You'll have to be awarded a certain amount of hours for supervision over that year and different universities award different hours. So how many hours am I entitled to as a student? Um, it's helpful to read books on nursing and healthcare literature reviews. There's several out there and you can access them through the library, but they will have lots of tips on how to formulate a research question, looking at your methods, your search strategy, um, appraisal tools, for example, and how to present your literature. Um, reading dissertations is also very helpful and some university dissertation supervisor module leads um, allow students to read other people's dissertations. They could go, for it, not to take home, but they might go into a room and read one, for example. Um, lots of libraries as well, healthcare libraries have example dissertations. So you can sort of see what the expectation is before you start. Looking at the marking grid is very important, as I said on the previous slide. And also I used to suggest to my students, um, dissertation students, to prepare folders for each section right at the start. And the reason for this is that you might find a really fantastic quote that links to your area of interest right at the start or even before you start and you can't find it again later. So if you've got a folder set up, you can put it in that folder with the full reference so you don't lose your references as you go along. And the same, not just for the background section, but for the method section, you might read a book and think, oh, this is really good about um, retrieving databases or about Boolean operators. 
and this is a really good sentence that I could put and, and reference and cite in my dissertation. So it's helpful to have those folders early on. It's also helpful to book healthcare library sessions that either a group or one-to-one -one if you're struggling. And healthcare librarians are especially specialized specialized in refining research questions. They can help you to use the Boolean operators, and that's the commands that are used on databases to combine keywords. Um, I learned how to save a search, so I didn't realize that you could run um, a search on CINAHL, which is a database, and you can save that search if you log in and get a sign in with CINAHL, for example. And that saves you a lot of time rerunning searches. So you can use the same search on Medline, for example. And um, also there are reference management tools such as EndNote. I only say EndNote, there's lots out there, but I, I used EndNote because it was free with my university. Um, and but there's these reference management tools create a database of references for you so you can file your PDFs, your references, if PDFs are available, but um, it creates a reference list for you. So you don't ever have to create a reference list again. Um, and I attended a group session, but didn't quite get there. And then I had to bring my computer in, but the, the library I was with offered a one-to-one -one session. So what's, you know, check out what's available. If you don't use a reference management tool, what I would say is to create those folders and make sure that you do your referencing as you go along if possible. Um, and once you've got these organisational and management files and systems and or your folders in place, it will really help your journey. And also it gives you momentum because you're sort of sectioning off different parts of the stages of the dissertation. So you start with an area of interest and your first um, hurdle is to formulate a research question, a searchable, researchable research question. And a key tip is to avoid a leading question. It should not have a closed yes, no answer or be answered with a simple statement. So an example of a question that wouldn't work would be, do prophylactic anticonvulsants decrease the risk of seizures in patients with brain surgery? The answer to that question is a yes. There's already a large evidence base to support this because I'm a neuro nurse um, and we routinely give prophylactic anticonvulsants. Um, so it's already answered with the medical literature. You should be looking at questions that can't be answered, they're not biased. So some examples might be, you might start a question with what are the experiences of, what are the perceptions of a certain group of patients, students or whatever. And that, that question could be answered positive or negative. It's open and it's unbiased. It's not leading you down one path. A question might be what effects do therapy pets have on people in nursing homes? So again, it's not leading because there could be positive effects or negative effects, a range of effects. Um, a, another question might be, how does the use of dance affect healthcare outcomes of patients with dementia? Again, this is a good question because it's not leading us um, down a particular effect or type of healthcare outcome. How effective are wellbeing programmes for a certain group? Um, my PhD question was, what is the quality of nurse patient interactions when nurses use EPR in hospital wards? And again, it, it can, it's, the quality could be poor, it could be high quality, it's not leading as it could be, it's open. Um, I've got a free video on my YouTube channel that offers a bit more advice of going from a large area of interest and gives you some tips on how to focus down and some other example questions that might also help you. And that's free on my YouTube channel. I think one of the hardest things students find is at the start is moving from a broad area of interest to a focused research question. And the key thing to say is it takes time, so don't rush it. You need to identify a researchable question um, that is unbiased. And it's one of the important decisions you make as the whole review can go off on a tangent if it doesn't work. So if you don't take time at the beginning to choose the right question, check with your supervisor as well. Um, and questions can be tweaked later. It's not set in stone, but you want a good question at the start. So, for example, you might change words in your question. You might find that you've got so much, um, so many studies that you don't want to include community or hospital. So you can tweak your question, but the overall question needs to be a good question at the start and unbiased. Um, it needs to be what you're interested in as well. You spend an awful lot of time 
in that you know looking at that area so you need to be interested in it it's helpful to talk to experts in the area advanced nurse practitioners advanced clinical practitioners educators senior nurses if it's specific linked to patient condition patient charities support groups it depends on your topic area um, and at the start it's helpful to look at abstracts and titles of art articles and look at the most widely cited articles in the area for example and if you go into google scholar even um, you'll see it, as you look at the articles it will say widely cited you'll see how many studies have cited that article which shows it's a key or seminal piece of work in the area so reading around the subject and you know you might want to write some ideas as you're reading um, some abstracts and titles and and in those abstracts you'll often have research questions and you need to think is this research question feasible or will i end up with too many studies or too little if it's too broad um, you'll have too many studies if it's too narrow you won't have as many and ideally you're looking at anything from sort of six to fifteen empirical primary studies ideally um, and anything in between that's great um, but asking the uni on what they expect how many studies do they expect as part of your dissertation often they will advise as well there are also several tools and acronyms to help you formulate and refine a research question um, and then you can reference those in your dissertation so the acronym PICO, P-I-C-O, was introduced in 1995 by Richardson et al, and the reference is at the end of the slides. PICO works more for quantitative research questions, um, and you've got P, population, which links to the patient group, for example, patients with dementia, or their age, or gender, or ethnicity. I, for intervention, what intervention did the group receive, for example, a drug? C, comparison, is there a control group, and what are they receiving? Is one group receiving a placebo? An O for outcome, what outcomes were measured? For example, pain decrease or decreasing tremors or infection rates. And that's why it links quite um, to quantitative experimental research. So the original PICO was later adapted to PICO with a T to help formulate and refine both qualitative and quantitative research questions or literature review questions. And a reference for this is Fine Out, Overholt and Johnson 2005, which is the created this broader acronym and so looking at my research question I used for my integrative review what is the quality of nurse patient interactions when nurses use EPR system in acute care hospital wards I used PICO to help formulate that question P population was registered nurses and patients the I intervention or issues so it's a bit more flexible was nurses EPR use C, comparison or context was acute hospital wards. The outcome that I was looking at um, and was quality of the nurse patient interactions and time or type of study it was an integrative, integrative literature review. It might be that you're looking more at qualitative or quantitative or mixed method studies. I, I looked at all of those different types of studies with my review. I mean, if you're looking at perceptions or experiences, you'll be looking more at a qualitative literature review. Um, and so you can use this tool in two ways. You might not have a research question yet, and it's a guide, so you don't have to adhere perfectly to it. You know, you can use it as a guide, and there's other tools which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, if you're not quite sure what question, you know, you haven't got your question, it's great to just sit and to start thinking about these different acronyms in these areas. If you've got a question, you can retrospectively use it to, you know, you could write a question and then help it helps refine it so um and when you're writing up in your thesis you could just say that you it, you used it to inform or to guide or to help formulate or refine your research question whatever way you used it and have a reference we also have the spider acronym developed by cook et al for qualitative research questions references at the end slide so you've got s for sample p for, for phenomenon of interest to understand the how and why of different behaviours, decisions and experiences. D for design, design, sorry. E for evaluation, which might include attitudes, perceptions or experiences. And R for research types. So, type. so have a play around with the different acronyms and which works for you to help formulate your literature review question. If the sort of standard acronyms don't work with your research question, there are alternatives. There's several alternatives such as Coco Pop or Spice. And if you go on the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme CASP website in 2023, they're currently under how to use the PICO framework to aid critical analysis. And you'll find them and you'll see guides um, that will help you with some example questions as well. 
So you formulated your research question. The next um, key area really is your methods and searching the literature and your methods chapter. You need to be clear and transparent about your search strategy. So you need to write notes as you go along. There should be an audit trail from start to finish so that you can present what you did, the decisions you made and how you searched and narrowed down the literature to your key studies. So essentially the reader or the marker should be able to rerun that search from the details that you've given in the methods section. The sort of things you need to detail are keywords, synonyms and truncations, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, where you retrieve the literature. So the major sources will be empirical primary research is what you're looking for. Um, subject specific healthcare databases that you use, such as Cochrane Library, CINAHL, Medline, you need to detail and list, you know, which databases you use. And that's why I mentioned earlier to have your folders ready. So you, you write down the names of the searches that you did or as I said earlier, you can save, retrieve and retrieve searches as well. If you link to your librarian, they can show you how to do that. So you can rerun searches so that it helps when you're writing up later. You may also use um, data, uh, websites, professional bodies, legal government websites, and you need to detail all of that. You might use snowball, what's called snowball sampling. Green, Helg and Peacock, I've given the reference at the end, is a good reference where you describe snow, they describe snowballing and they call it reference tracking and scanning reference lists of full text papers. And then you use your judgment to decide whether to pursue a certain paper in the reference list if it links to your, if you think it's got interest or links to your um, research. You um, also need to detail the date ranges for retrieving literature in your sources. Are you going to go back 10 years? which is quite standard, or are you going to go back further or keep it um, within the last five years or two years? It depends on purely on your research question as to what's appropriate. You also can narrow down and widen searches using date ranges, but also inclusion exclusion criteria. What are you going to, what papers are you going to include or exclude? So you might exclude papers that are non-English, for example, um, because it wouldn't be you wouldn't have the time and the finances to translate articles that are not in English. Um, you might include only um, include hospital or all healthcare settings. So that's quite inclusive. Or you might exclude by um, saying that you're uh, you're going to exclude community based settings and you're only going to include hospital. So you can use the inclusion and exclusion criteria to zoom out or zoom in to using your research question to papers um, so that you're not getting overwhelmed with too many or too, or have too little papers as well. So I'm going to give you some key tips linked to keywords, synonyms, truncations and Boolean operators. So when you start searching the literature, you've got your research question. You need to identify the keywords, synonyms and truncations from your research question to use on library databases so you don't miss an important paper. Boolean operators are commands that you use on a database to that help you combine keyword searches so you can select or exclude certain words and um, they help you zoom out and narrow in on, on those key papers. And don't forget that healthcare librarians are there to help you. They've got specialist skills on using these Boolean operators. And I had to ask for one to one with a librarian, a healthcare librarian, when I was looking into my PhD literature review, because I had to be really sure there wasn't a paper out there that I'd missed. So do use the library um, uh, librarians because they're so helpful. So I thought to explain keywords, synonyms and truncations, it's helpful to use an example that I've used in the past. Um, so I had a research question. How does intentional rounding influence the bedside interactions between patient and nurse in UK hospitals? Now, before I go and look at the databases, I need to have my search words, my synonyms and my truncations ready so that I can use Boolean operators. And it's quite nice. I've got in the table and when you're doing writing up your thesis, you might write them in a table. And you'll see the key search words from that research question are bedside, nurse, patient, interaction, intentional rounding. So think about what are the key words that I'm using in my um, literature review question. And it might have perceptions. It might be to do with dementia patients. Um, you know, whatever question you have, you're going to have some key words. A synonym is 
essentially a word or a phrase that means exactly or nearly the same as your keyword. So you'll see, for example, under patient, a synonym might be client or I could even have included service user potentially. Um, but it's another word for patient or patients with an S. Under nurse as a keyword, I might also look at papers with nurses, nursing or nursed in. They're similar words. And then truncation, also called stemming, is a technique that broadens your search to include different word end endings or spellings. So the database will return any papers that include um, any ending of that root word. So for, if you look at nurse, for example, um, it has an asterisk and you use an asterisk for this truncation technique on healthcare databases. So that means that when I put in nurse with that asterisk, it will pick up papers with nursing, nurses, nursing or nursed. Similarly, if we look at um, client patient, I've got client and patient, you use a truncation after the T on client and the T on patient and that will pick up all papers with client, patient or clients um, and patients, so plural and singular versions. And you should do that for all your keywords. So I hope that um, presents it sort of a bit more simply of, of how that process takes place. And again, you can do it, get your synonyms, truncations and then ask a librarian, do you think I've missed anything here? Um, and they, they're very good for advice or your tutors, your um, personal supervisors as well. So I've also got one for my PhD. What impact does nurses use of electronic patient records have on nurse patient interactions? So that was a literature review that I was doing. And the reason I'm showing you this is if you look at the keywords, we've got nurses, patient, interaction and electronic patient record. And if you look on the right, there is some quotation marks on electronic patient record because you can also um, keep phrases together and um, that will link to the Boolean operators. So that may be something that links as well to your re specific research question. So you have your keywords, synonyms and truncations worked out and you're going to now go to healthcare databases and use Boolean operators to combine those words and synonyms and truncations. And Boolean operators widen or narrow the search within the database to select or exclude certain words. So the Boolean operators that are used are the words and, or, or not, and they're always written in block capitals currently on um, healthcare databases. If you use the Boolean operator and, it will limit the search. So for example, you put nurse and hospital, you would have millions of hits on that database. But if you put and falls, you're going to have more focused um, papers come through. So the area becomes more focused, narrowed, and you have less hits at the end of that database, less papers to look through. Similarly, you can use an or and that will, in comparison, sorry, you use the word or and it's going to expand and widen your database as two words can be used. So you could use client or patient or service users. So you're going to capture, if you use the word client, you're going to capture all papers with the word client in. But if you put client or patient, you're going to capture even more papers, the papers that don't use the word patient, but client, but use the word pa patient. And then you might get more if you use the term service user. So that's going to expand your search. Boolean operators with the word not limits and excludes data with that specific term. So you can start narrowing further by putting not community, for example, or not hospital. So that's another way of um, limiting your data. So part of your writing up your search strategy, you've got to clearly present an audit trail. So, so far we've got the PICO tool to help us develop our question. We have got our key terms, our synonyms and truncations. You're going to have a list of databases to look because you're going to start with the databases. And it's important that you detail the database search results in some way. Now, lots of students will use tables. If you go into books that are on how to write literature reviews, they will have examples tables you can write it in whatever way suits your research your your researching and how you retrieved your data but you're showing how you've gone from a large number of hits with more broader terms 
down to a more focused um, number of hits. So this is an example table that I've used, a database search result table. On the left, you'll see key search terms, which includes the synonyms and truncation. So when I start with interact or communication, I am going to um, have the most amount of hits. And at the top, you've got all the different databases. You'll see with each database, if I put in interact with a truncation or communication with a truncation, I'll get thousands and thousands of hits. When I start using the Boolean operators, so if we go down to the middle column, interact or communicate and bedside and nurse and patient, it's starting to go down. When I integrate all of those um, words, key terms, synonyms, truncations, it goes right down into, the, into a lower number. And I'm ending up with 476 papers. If you look at the total hits on the right, and that's quite a large number of papers, but I've whittled that down to those thousands of papers and I've shown clearly how I've done it. So a table is a great way to do that. But as I said, you still got to put that table in context and context and describe what you do, did. Um, and from those 476 papers, I'm still going to imp in apply inclusion and exclusion criteria. Though of those 476 papers, there'll be duplicates. There will be papers not in English, for example. There will be papers that don't relate to my research question. And that's why you have inclusion and exclusion criteria as well. So I hope you find that helpful to have that table. So it's important that you establish your inclusion and exclusion criteria for which studies you're going to include and which you're going to exclude when you do a literature review. So an example for mine was that I included only included studies that were published in the in the English language. And you can see sort of the opposite of that with an exclusion. I'd exclude any that were published in a language other than English. Um, I uh, included studies that examined the interactions or communication between a nurse and patient whilst EPR was being used by nurses in any healthcare setting. So the opposite of that is no examination of interactions or communications, etc. Um, but you can see that inclusion criteria can be broadened out or narrowed down according to demographics, location, hospital community, hospice, specific stroke units. It depends on your research question and that would inform your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Also on the basis of the people, um, it could be professionals, is it nurses, AHPs, all healthcare professionals or registered and types of nurses, is it experienced nurses, newly registered nurses, students, um, looking at patients with certain conditions. So it's helpful to talk to supervisors if you're unsure about your inclusion and exclusion criteria. <clears throat> So you've done your database searching, you've got your key number of articles. So when I did mine on intentional round, I had 476, which is quite a large number of articles, but they have to be screened. Some of them will be duplicates, for example, some won't be in the English language. And Mohar in 2009 um, created this really helpful flowchart that lots of researchers have used. They might adapt it to show this visually how um, you narrow down from those 476, those initial hits on the database, applying your inclusion exclusion criteria, and you will end up with your key articles. So on the next slide, I've got an example of how I've used it. And it, it really shows that audit trail from your initial set of numbers going down. And on that chart, um, MOHA is open access. I've got the reference at the end and you will see a, an example chart. And I adapted that and some researchers will adapt it. So you start off with an initial number of records through database searching and additional searching. Screening is the next number where you've taken out your duplicates and then you've got the eligibility aspects. So you've got a number of articles assessed for eligibility, can't speak, and number excluded with the reasons. And then you've got the included number of key studies at the end. So I'll show that on the next slide. So for any of you that want to use a Prisma flow diagram um, to show your screening and exclusion process, um, I've got an example here um, that I used doing when I did a literature review on intentional rounding. So I initially had that number of 476 through database searching. And then I re removed duplicates. I've got the number there. And so I was let, then left with 258 articles. And those articles were, I really screened the title and the abstracts and um, excluded 241. 
And the reasons for exclusion are written in bullets, not published in English. There was no examination of bedside interactions between a nurse and patient during a patient round and evidence was or evidence was purely anecdotal. So it might have been a debating piece from one nurse. Um, so the full text articles that were left were 17. So I had 17 full, full text articles that um, were appraised for the quality and I could critically appraise them using my CASP tool. Um, and, and so it clearly shows how I've, the decisions that sort of have been made. And I would also write in my thesis um, about, this wasn't linked to a thesis, but if this was, this was linked to a thesis, I'd be writing about writing this as well and then saying see figure one. Um, so I hope that's helpful if any of you do want to um, use Mohair et al and adapt that Prisma tool. So some tips on appraising and analysing, synthesising the literature. So once you've completed your search strategy, you have your main papers to answer your research questions. So you could see that I had 17 papers when I'd screened um, and I, they were linked to intentional rounding. Now that wasn't for a thesis, so you, ideally you'd have a little bit less hopefully, but um, you're going to individually appraise each of those key articles and then the next stage is to critically analyze as a whole and you're going to synthesize all of the literature as a whole to form your inform your findings your results and your th themes there'll be overall themes that come out and that also informs your discussion and it's really helpful to break it down and think about it in two stages. So the individual appraising of articles, and um, I'll talk a little bit about how you can present that in, in tables, for example, um, and, and then the synthesizing where you're forming themes and um, fr from the findings of those papers. So when you're appraising and evaluating your individual articles, you're going to be looking at the relevance to your research question, the type of study, is it from a reputable journal, which setting, country might have a bearing on it, um, especially when you're writing up, you might want to say that there was, a if you're looking globally at articles, um, how many were from the US or from Canada or from the UK and similarly settings so how many were hospital community it very much depends on your research question but it may have a bearing on, on your evaluation what's the intention aim or purpose who the authors are are they experts in the field the research methods used the types of data analysis the date of publication um, is it relatively new um, up to date, key findings, results, outcomes, conclusions, and then limitation strengths and weaknesses. And these are the sort of things you're going to be looking for. And if you use a um, published, uh, recognized critical appraisal tool, you'll have key questions that will link to the, you know, many of these areas. To help students critique a research article and to understand the difference between qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods of research, I've got some simple videos that are free on my YouTube channel that you might find helpful as well. So when you critically appraise individual papers for your literature review, there is a range of critical appraisal checklists that you can use that are published and they're free to download on the CASP checklist critical appraisal skills program website that's an internationally renowned website that currently has available these free checklists to download now there's a range of tools appraisal tools and there's different tools for different types of studies so if your dissertation is all qualitative studies you'll be using the same critical appraisal checklist if you've got a mixed method study you might use the, the um, mixed Methods Appraisal Tool from Hongatal 2008, 18. So I've got references for, for that tool. It just depends on the type of study and there's a range of, of um, appraisal checklists out there. In a dissertation, thesis, literature review, you need to include the reference, reference. And some students will put an example of the checklist in their appendix, or they might even um, have a table where they've um, appraised um, several articles and they show it visually as well as um, signposting it in their as narrative in their dissertation. So on the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme website, you've got free downloadable CASP checklists for systematic reviews, qualitative studies. I should say, when I say systematic reviews, you don't use that for every study that you've got when you've done a literature review. Um, but if you've included a systematic review as part of your literature review, um, you would use that checklist. Qualitative study checklist, randomised control trials, cohort study, case study, diagnostic study and economic evaluation checklists.
The Mixed Methods Appraisal Tool from Hong et al. 2018 um, covers qualitative research, randomised control trials, non-randomised studies, quantitative descriptive studies and mixed method studies. And there are a lot more appraisal tools out there, but I've signposted some key ones that you could use. So you've individually critically appraised all your um, key articles and you need to bring them together as a whole, compare, contrast, synthesise and your themes will emerge from that data that will inform your findings, your discussion. So a great way to do that is to have summary or a data extraction table where you present all of your key articles. You might have, say, seven articles. You're presenting them in a bullet pointing in a table, extracting key data. So some of the headings might be author year setting, title of paper, aim of study, type of study design, research methods, analysis, key findings, limitations, whatever headings suit the types of studies that you found. Um, now you can see example data extraction tables potentially in books, how to write literature reviews. Often they've got some example headings and tables. If you look at dissertations, um, as I mentioned at the earlier, um, as part of your preparation, you might see some great data extraction tables. And um, another way would be to look at reputable journals like Journal of Advanced Nursing, where they present literature reviews. Often they'll present data, example data extraction tables. Um, and so it's helpful to help with that synthesis. It's helpful visually. Check with your universities on where they go, whether they would prefer them to be in an appendix or in the main body of your thesis. Um, whatever happens, you, you can't use say that that's your synthesis. You still have to write up your, your discussion, your themes. You've got to appraise those articles in detail. But having those tables helps. Um, it'll help with your write up and also it helps the reader um, see all the different processes and the systematic approach that you used to extracting your data. So looking at synthesis and this is going to link to your discussion and your themes. You've appraised your individual articles, you've extracted your data, you've compared contrast and you've got themes emerging. Um, and all synthesis is, it's where you um, have individual components that connect to form a whole. So your individual articles, you're looking at all that body of evidence and findings. And so what did you find as a whole body of sources? What does the evidence suggest? What themes are emerging from the data? And um, rereading the, the appraisal, you know, really knowing your data um, and having data extraction tools, comparing, contrasting is going to help. Discuss discussions with your supervisor will help. Students find this stage quite difficult. Um, sometimes I would say to students, right, just tell me in two sentences what you found. And they could do that really clearly. And I'd say, right, th themes are coming out here. Why don't you think about this? Um, and and so, so, for example, if you um, were looking at nurses' experiences during the um, preceptorship period, you might have positive experiences and more challenging negative experiences. So they might be the two key themes. And that's the way you want to write up your appraisal and your findings. Um, and but under um, positive, you might have um, education programs, preceptorship program, you might have the support in the clinical area as in a good manager or a leader. So you might have sub themes that you can sort of put under there. It really depends on your topic and your findings. And you also might have findings that you might have this large scale study that has says the complete opposite to the rest of your data, the rest of your research. Um, and don't be afraid to put that in as well. So some data might oppose and contradict. Absolutely fine. It doesn't always fit perfectly. But as long as there's some format to your write up, you might start with the more larger studies, for example. Um, and, and there's all different ways of writing those discussions. But as I said, look at other people's dis dissertations, go to libraries. There's going to be some um, th theses in libraries. Look at, um, you know, papers that have been written up, um, literature reviews and how they've themed their literature reviews in a publication. They'll do it in, with less words, but they still will have themed. You'll see how they've themed their findings. Um, what are the implications of your findings to inform your recommendations? And that might link to patients, practice, the profession, nurse education or research. Um, and again, I would spend you're probably going to be going back to your supervisors and discussing your findings. And that will really help. I think having supervision as well to help you with your discussion and, and theming your findings. Um, so I hope that helps.
So when you move to the write-up, um, I've got a free video on my YouTube channel, Critical Analysis in Essays, but it's also helpful um, when you're looking at your thesis because there's examples of individual articles appraised and then writing that shows more synthesis, so that might be quite helpful. I also have some free videos on my YouTube channel, citations and referencing, so it links to paraphrasing, in-text citations, and also how to write in the third person with some practical examples. So I hope that the videos have helped, and I hope that this simple overview of some key tips to help you with your dissertation helps. So I'm just going to present some of the references. I won't go th through too quickly because um, it's hard for students to find the references later. Um, I can't put HTTP references from Google because it takes you off YouTube, So, I, but you can find them obviously when you go onto Google. Um, so some more references there. And some more references there. So if you need to contact me with any questions, do put them in the YouTube comments. If you prefer to DM me privately, you can DM me on Twitter um, or on my website. And do check out, I've got two books, How to Thrive as a Newly Registered Nurse and How to Prepare for Interviews and Develop Your Career right up to Band 8. So um, good luck with your dissertations. I really hope they go well and your literature reviews. Let me know how you get on and I wish you every success in your future careers.